You are watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV from Toronto, Ontario. I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. What are Indigenous people saying about the Pope's visit and apology? We will talk to Chief Robert Joseph, who is a hereditary chief of a First Nation in British Columbia. But first, some news headlines. Ontario's government delivers speech from throne. Search for unmarked graves begins in Alberta. Muslim Link launches rental section. Four Palestinians killed by Israeli forces in West Bank. Now the details. Ontario's PC government has said in its throne speech yesterday that although the province's healthcare sector is overstressed, it is not in crisis. Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell delivered the speech, marking the start of a rare summer legislative term. The PC government says that despite the shutdown of emergency rooms, nine out of 10 emergency visits were completed within target times. The government also highlighted its $40 billion contribution to the healthcare sector. Rachel Muir, the bargaining president for the Ontario Nurses Association at Ottawa Hospital, says that the government should determine the cause of health care experts leaving the industry despite heavy investments. A ground-penetrating search to find unmarked graves at the site of the former Blue Quills Indian Residential School has started Tuesday in Alberta. The site is now home to UNBQ, an Indigenous university operated by seven First Nations. University President Sherry Chizan told a media source yesterday that the local community has long heard about deaths and burials taking place at Blue Quills. Chizan says that there is a sense of urgency as many former students are aging and want to know about the history of the school attended by members of their community. The search is funded by Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada and the university. Muslim Link has launched a rental section on its website to help Muslims find places to live in various cities. This comes at a time when rental costs are soaring across Canada, making it difficult to find decent options in the market. Record inflation makes it a struggle to pay rent. Muslim Link's rental section is in its initial phases. It invites landlords to put their properties up on the site by clicking the rental tab on muslimlink.com. Muslim Link was Ottawa Gatineau's first English language newspaper and is now an online hub with articles, events and business listings for all Canadian Muslims. Israeli forces killed four people Tuesday in the occupied West Bank, including two teens. And a man Israel says was a senior militant commander. The latest violence comes two days after a truce halted a deadly conflict between the Israeli military and Islamic Jihad militants in Gaza. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, a 16-year-old was killed in Nablus and later a 17-year-old had been shot dead in Hebron. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society says that it treated 69 people for gunshot wounds across the Nablus area with four of them in critical condition. Hundreds of mourners gathered in Nablus for the funeral procession of the three dead Palestinians. And that's it for the news. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission made a call that the Pope apologize for the church's role in the residential schools in Canada and that the apology be made in Canada. Seven years later, that has happened, and we're very honoured today to have with us Chief Robert Joseph, OCOBC, Hereditary Chief of the Gua Gua Enuk First Nation in British Columbia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be on here. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Now, after the delegation of Inuit, Métis and Indigenous people went to Rome in April and the Pope did an apology there, and you had posted a, a short video response, I think it was on Facebook, where you welcomed the Pope's apology, but you also said there were things that were missing. And I'm wondering now, after the Pope has been here and done the apology in Canada, if you feel still that there were things that were missing. Uh, there are. I think the, um, uh, the uh, papal apology fell short of um, follow-up action that 
is going to be required to give uh, meaning and impact to the to the apology. But nonetheless, uh, I think that ha having had the Pope come to Canada and make the um, apology in front of survivors was an important, significant e event and had uh, meaning for many, many survivors and their quest for continued healing. So that's always um, important to remind ourselves. And it was a huge first step. Mm -hmm. I think that what we do moving forward is continue to work uh, with the uh, churches, uh, the Canadian Council of Bishops, as well as the people um, office in, in the Vatican to continue to chart out uh, required steps that will give a real impact to the, to the apology. One of the things we had a Catholic scholar on last week giving us Catholic re reflections. And I asked him, I, it's not always easy for a perpetrator to apologize and say, yes, it was wrong. And the Pope did this in the full glare of international. Do you think there was, I don't want to downplay the indigenous suffering, but was there any kind of courage in, in that step, the first step of apology? Yeah, it, it was really an important first step. And I uh, applaud, uh, the uh, Pope for having taken that step. It wasn't easy for him. Uh, what he essentially was doing was ad additionally adding validation to the harm and loss that those of us who went to those schools went through. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like an admission, a confession. And it was important that the people around the world, Catholics, and others begin to truly know what the history of those res re residential schools uh, is. Mm -hmm. You have a memoir coming out in September, and there's a very heart-wrenching excerpt online where you narrate the story of how your mother had taken you and left you without a word at a residential school in British Columbia, I believe. So did you feel sad that the Pope didn't make it to your territory to make the apology in person? Yeah, yeah, I was kind of hoping that he might make it to our area to, to make the apology. But over time, I got over that. I think what was important was that the, the, the Pope did uh, make this trip to Canada and did apologize in front of survivors. And it means a lot to many, many of us survivors. Some are still angry, of course, and didn't want to entertain the idea of an apology from the Pope. But I think every time we have an apology, it's it's stripping away another layer of the uh, harm and the trauma that was experienced over time. And so it's really important. The other thing that's really important in my mind is that Catholics around the world uh, finally knew about the real history of residential schools mm -hmm. and the harm done to generations of small ch indigenous children. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And I think because of the discovery of those, some of those really deep harms and the intention behind them, it's been talked about um, as genocide as well. Mm -hmm. I think what is really important is that we we accept the gravity of our shared history and then we can move forward together. And I believe Canadians as well as Catholics are beginning to have a deeper grasp of our history together. Well, not just ca not just Catholics, but I mean, Muslim community like like, our, like ourselves, we, ha we have very few people who are involved in uh, indigenous, Mus uh, indigenous Muslim relations. And I think that this uh, apology and visit, it's affecting the Muslim community as well. In fact, I wanted to ask you, there's a, a Muslim black Canadians who are calling on the Canadian government to apologize for its role in slavery. And I was wondering if you thought this, this apology for the res residential schools was going to spill over into apologies for, for other communities who have also suffered oppression. Absolutely. You know what? We live in a, a country that's so full of diversity. Everybody on earth is living here now. Every color, every creed, every race. And we still have a lot of work to do to break down the barriers that separate us by faith, 
by race and by those other things that I just mentioned. And so we owe it to ourselves, all Canadians, to be inclusive. And, to, and whenever there has been tension and inhumanity to others, we have to confront that, challenge it, and work together to create the country that we all want here in Canada. Mm. You are one of the last few speakers of, I'm going to see if I can pronounce it well, the Kwa Kwa Ka Waku language. Yes. You correct me? It's called Kwa Kwa La. Yeah. Kwa Kwa La. That's the language, yeah. So you're one of the last few speakers. And I noticed in one of your writings that you had asked the church to facilitate language classes in its buildings. I, that really struck me. I was wondering if you could tell us more about what you meant. You know, uh, uh, in the area that I come from, uh, north of here, we now have a, a uh, camp out in the wilderness in one of the ancient sacred sites of our people where the first ancestor manifested and began the tribe that uh, now lives in that area. Uh, this uh, particular sacred site has been vacant and empty for a long, long, long time. Uh -huh. Now, uh, the young people up there have gotten together. They built a culture and language camp, and uh, they're beginning to boast that it will be the first place on earth where only Kwakwala will be spoken. Uh -huh. And so dedicated, so committed to the idea that we can revive our languages, and if we can revive our languages, we can better revive our spirits and continue to move forward and grow grasp the full uh, intensity of our humanity as individuals. Mm -hmm. all, all of that work is always going to be critically important. That language needs to be revitalized. In, inherent, embedded in those words of that ancient language are descriptions of the universe and our relationship with each other and with the animal world and all of creation are so important to begin to embrace again, understand that we are one. All of us are one. All of the races who now live here and share this country and everything else, all of the beauty and the grandeur, we're, it's all one. And we need to think in those terms and work towards that oneness, the wholeness of who we all are. Muslims experienced during French colonial, colonialism in North Africa and uh, British colonialism in South Asia, the same, the same issue where the, their languages were banned from being spoken in the schools. And I, I just wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about what language means to you as an important thing to re revive. You know, when I was a little boy and I, I, I lived in the area before it was uh, populated, before it was colonized, and there were less than 100 non-Indigenous people in the entire area. And so my parents, my grandparents, and all the community spoke this one language. Mm -hmm. uh, inherent in the, in the language was the notion, especially about children, that was so precious. We had meaningful, deep, meaningful words about how we described children. Wajit, you are so monumental. Klugwe, you are a supernatural blessing. So we had this language that mm -hmm. gave description not only to the reality at that time of how precious everyone was, especially children, mm -hmm. and how we were all connected and that what we did and said impacted all of us, so we had to be in tune with our collectivity, to be sensitive, to be caring, to be compassionate, and really um, experience uh, every day our, our relationship as sacred, you know. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I wish we had more time, but thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing these thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you like what we do, please share, like, and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.